I thought I'd uh, introduce myself a little bit quickly because there are some faces here I haven't seen before. Um, I had uh, most of you in, in uh, theory of the philosophy of science. Um, I'm a second year master's student and I'm writing my thesis on cognitive psychology and what I want to replace it with, which is ecological psychology. Um, so the way that I've structured this is that, and the way I've structured my thesis is that it works in two parts. So the first one is that, the first part is that I critique or, or reflect on what assumptions are made in the traditional cognitive literature, if they're good assumptions or, or perhaps not so very good. Um, and then I'm going to quickly go through, because it's it's a huge thing to create a whole new perspective, and it won't. No, no, no more. Like and um, for me to go through everything, I mean, they have full courses on on ecological psychology in, in different universities. So, but I'll touch on the important parts and try and give you an idea. Um, and hopefully you'll have some critiques, some, some comments, and uh, we'll have a discussion afterwards. So I've tried to keep this short, but sufficient to gain some knowledge about it. And I have very, very pretty animations as well. So if you get bored, you can look at those and imagine. Alright. So, the title is Cognitive Psychology in Crisis, Ameliorating the Shortcomings of Rep Representationalism. Um, cognitive psychology, in the traditional sense, uses representations um, to explain a lot of the processes in the brain and, and what we do, and it explains behaviors, or so they say. Um, already in 1895, a guy named Titchener um, proposed that the way the stuff works inside us is that it's a linear process, and the processes are separated, they're isolated from each other. <clears throat> he made the example of, uh, in a simple reaction time task, where he had a baseline that supposedly went through mental processes 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then he added uh, a decision to that, to that task, and, oh sorry, the simple one would be this, and then the decision one would include M3, which the simple reaction task doesn't. And so we reason that if I take the times minus each other for these two tasks, I'll get the time taken to actually make a decision. Um, this was critiqued by, by Dewey the year after. Um, he said that what Titchener was talking about is a reflex arc. It starts in the body, ascends to the mind, and goes out to the body again in an isolated and linear fashion. Um, he said that it's, due, that it's subject to the empiricist fallacy, and he lobbied this uh, criticism specifically against Titchener. But I'm going to use it here in a broader sense because it speaks to representations in general. Um, because Dewey made the point that, well, we're actually looking at, at one behavior, and then we're looking at a second behavior, but everything in between is an assumption. M1 through M4 they're all assumptions about how things work and what exists. They're not something that we have observed. So that's why that process in between here is a question. And that's the argument. So, representations as assumptions. We have the unobservable entities, the M1 through M4. The assumption is that they're linear and isolated. And Dewey was talking more so about, well, they aren't just isolated processes in our brain. There's stuff going on apart from that. Uh, he wanted to say that we had organic circuits instead. And he wanted to include the environment more so. Um, he wanted to include our body more so than, than Titchener did. And he's argued that there were parallel processes, not only these linear separated things, but that there's a lot going on at the same time. And they're loosely coupled with each other and affect each other. The usual defense you get from cognitivists is that neurophysiology or neuroimaging gives supports to, to finding these unobservables, to actually observe what previously was unobserved. And the issue with this is that there are a lot of problems with neuroimaging as it is. Uh, it's not a clear-cut science. It's not 
uh, as concrete as, as, as you commonly believe. Um, the main issues, the first one, is that you have baseline comparison issues, which essentially means that when you do these studies, in, for example, in an fMRI study, you have a baseline behavior, which is basically <coughs> things lying here and don't really do anything, just think freely. And then you ask them to do something like count or solve a problem and whatever else. But the issue here is that you compare this behavior to something that you don't really know what they're doing. They might be solving algorithms in their head because they think that's fun or there's just, we just can't know what they're doing with this baseline. So we don't have a, a good baseline in that sense. Also, the studies that they present, they usually only focus on the differences between these two tasks. Uh, when you speak about images, the, the amount of activation. This difference is at most 5% between these two brains, so to speak, or the two images. There's 95% of activation that's the same in both tasks. And what is that? And that's usually ignored or not talked about. So we don't know what that 95% is. Uh, it's usually also treated as, say you have this task where they do solve a problem and they see some more activation in some area. They treat it as if there are essential regions of activation, when in actual fact it's just a coincidence of activation. There's no causal, you can't get a causal mechanism out of it, it's, it's a correlation essentially. Um, another issue is that there are several steps of inferences when you talk about imaging, and perhaps specifically fMRI. Uh, the first inference is that more thoughts equals more activation. Um, the second inference is that more activation is more blood flow. And blood flow is what we see in fMRI, for example. Um, so these two steps of inferences give issues if you want to argue that what we actually are seeing are thoughts, or are whatever process it is that you want to um, discover or, or look at. And the last issue is that not only all of this, but this also <laughs> averages. It av it's averages over time, it's average over space, over regions, um, and it's also an average between participants. And this is also, this also models the, the results that you get, that are, are barely mentioned. Now, this is known with neuroscientists most often. They have workshops, and I know of one specifically, um, that, that brings in scientists, and they discuss amongst themselves, what are the analytical issues we have with, with this specific method, for example. So neuroscientists are usually quite good with this, and they know the issues already, but there are issues with cognitive type people that take these studies and, and think that they've proven something, and then they use that as, as proof when really it doesn't lend itself to it. So we don't really get much evidence from neuroimaging, and we're stuck with these unobservable entities. So, if we then resort to saying that, all right, so representations might not be, uh, exist at all, but they can be useful anyways. Uh, we think of them as theoretical entities. This is called entity realism, and would be a last outpost for representations. Um, it means basically that if you have an unobservable thing, uh, you can use it as a tool if it lends itself as one to observable processes. Gravity is a good example of this, because we don't actually know what the physical makeup of gravity is, but it's obviously very useful to physicists, so that would be an example. But in psychology, just because we, 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 see, we observe behavior one, we observe behavior two, and we name the process in between memory, what does it explain? In my mind, it doesn't really explain anything. We've just named something that we don't really know what it is, or even if it does, in fact, exist. So what are we doing this for? And if this is the last outpost you can give to representations, then you might want to rethink, uh, reconsider using it at all. Recently uh, in the US, Obama's um, accepted a, a proposal called uh, the Mind Mapping something. Uh, and it's a $100 million project where they want to map the brain. And this is not a very good idea. It's, it's, it's a good initiative, but it's not a very good idea relying on these representations and stuff and, and getting the areas out that do specific things. Um, 
So I try to find out something like, well, what, what do we know about the brain, and what, what is there to, to, to find in the brain if there does not exist representations or whatever. And in response to this brain mapping, there was a lot of criticism, and one of them was a blog post just about this. Um, and what we do know is that there aren't really these finite, discrete areas, but the brain is deeply interconnected. We have connections everywhere. It's just what our brain is, essentially. Um, exemplified this by this is, is the visual areas that we, at first thought, relying on Titchener's type of uh, argument, um, that visual processing goes to V1, to 2, to 3, and that's what it does. And it's, a, again, a linear process, an isolated one. But we know that there are connections between 3 and 1 and 2 and 1 and 3 and 1 and 3. And it goes both ways. And it goes all through these three and not in a linear fashion. Um, there's no uniform organization of the brain. You have functional areas that emerge flexibly in a human's life. And a good indication of this is that they usually only use right-handed participants. Because such a simple thing as being left-handed actually reorganizes your brain sufficiently for it to cause enough error so you can't have them in these studies. Um, another thing that we're good at is, is naming things by first encounter. So my example of this is, is when they discovered mirror neurons. They were very excited and surprised that how can mirror neurons uh, fire when we're looking at someone else's um, uh, movements when that's done in the motor cortex where our movements are supposed to be. But the issue is here, I mean, this, this doesn't have to be surprising at all. I mean, all that we've done with the motor cortex is that, well, the first studies found that that was where our movement resides. But that doesn't say that there are other stuff going on. It doesn't say that it has other functions. So it doesn't have to be surprising at all. And naming things is, uh, again, with the visual areas, with V1, 2, and 3, it makes little sense because you get assumptions of what the brain does. And when you get results that don't fit with those assumptions, you're surprised. So a famous study was made on dead Atlantic salmon. They put it in an fMRI and they showed pictures of social situations to the salmon and they asked the salmon uh, what emotion was, was appropriate to feel in this situation. Um, and they found a, f a fair amount of activation in, in the dead salmon's brain. And the issue here is that if you do a simple statistical error, uh, not un you show uncorrected results. What happens is that you get more activation than, that, than actually is there. This lends itself to type 1 errors, that we actually find something, but in actual fact, obviously, because it's a dead sound, um, there is no activation. It's a type 1 error. <coughs> the opposite of this, you can correct this uh, mathematically, but the issue, issue with a corrected data set is that you get too little activation. So you're prone to type 2 errors instead. And there's been suggestions for scientists to, to show both, both their uncorrected and their corrected data. Um, but it's, it's still an issue that there are still studies coming out that have uncorrected data but just don't mention the issues with it. Um, so, we also know that the brain depends a lot on bodily systems and even worldly systems. The example of, of bodily systems is that from this, um, the, the skeptical neuroimaging workshop, uh, is that they found that you have to take in con into consideration the heartbeats when you're doing fMRI studies on something specific that I've forgotten, uh, because it, otherwise it distorts the data. So the heartbeat obviously being part of your body, being something that you have to take in into consideration, also speaks against this isolated or, or linear fashion that, that we believe the brain works in. Uh, as for worldly systems, many of you might remember we went through dynamic systems theory, and it was a little bit difficult, and we had the what governor. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail there, but I finally figured out why time was so important. Because essentially what you get, say even with an fMRI image or, or something else, is something static in time. You only get one, um, one time frame, if, if you like. 
Um, but we live in, in a dynamical world, we have dynamical re relationships. Things change in real time and there are immediate consequences to that. So it makes little sense to talk about things in specific one points in time. We need a whole series or a process of it. So going through all this, I, I started asking myself, well, okay, what, what can I conceive of must exist in the brain? Because your brain does something, obviously. It's not, it's not there without a reason. Evolution would have gotten rid of it by now, if that was the case. Um, and this is just, this is, these are just two thoughts that I had that I sort of figured, well, this, this probably has to be there. The one in brackets I'm, I'm unsure with, so take that one lightly. But obviously, we, we hear, we see, we touch, and that obviously has to have some form of activation in your brain. Uh, there has to be overlap, because we do things simultaneously. Um, and this obviously has to overlap with movement as well, because we guide our body and we move in, in the environment and stuff like that. But the main reason I, I show this slide here is because it's, it's a worthwhile question. Because we make so many assumptions of what the brain does, it's, it's complex, it's, uh, it solves issues and, and it interprets things and it does these amazing things. But they're not necessary. We don't necessarily have them in our brain. And it's, it's a good question to ask, I think. So if, it, if it's this riddled with, with issues, why do we still have it? And one of the reasons is that it relies on something called Hegelian arguments. Hegelian arguments are basically arguments put forward to constrain or restrict alternative explanations. Um, one example of this is, is Chomsky's verbal learning argument. One of the conclusions from that is that if you do not have innate language in your theory, then you can't account for language. This, rem this, this restricts the, the, air, the field of study because any other explanation is, is denied without even going further into than that, without listening to the arguments. And these arguments aren't taken lightly in the discipline. They're followed, they're relied on. And that creates issues, obviously, because if we have issues like I do with rep representations, what do I do to create an alternative when someone's already said that I can't do that? I came across falsifiability again. Um, thinking of the memory experiments, you have someone come in, sit down, read a list of words, and then you uh, have them recall those words later on. And obviously the process in between isn't observed, it's assumed, and all of this that I've gone through. What if a participant can't remember any words, or can remember very few? Does that falsify theory? No, it doesn't. And there are two issues with this. The first one is that obviously a theory not being falsifiable is, is, uh, is uh, in question whether it is a theory at all. If you can't falsify it, it's, it's, it's not good science, basically. But the other thing is that maybe we're not even justified to, to falsify, say, memory from a participant not being able to recall anything. Because what is it that memory experiments are looking at? Well, they're looking at the unobservable process. And they're trying to get to it through the two observable behaviors. But that's not what the theory is talking about. So we're not actually testing the theory per se. We're testing something else which is an inference towards what we are actually saying with our theory. So that protects the theory and protects us too much, in my mind. Another thing is, is a frame of reference issue. And there was a, a neat example with frogs. What they did was, when they were tadpoles, they shifted the eye 180 degrees so that it would see forward as backward and down as up. And when they grew up into, into adult frogs, if a fly flew over the back of it, um, it would stick its tongue out in front. And it couldn't adapt its behavior. It was, it was fixed. And why we see this as, as, as a, not a problem, but something worth investigating, is that we can see the frog both in an objective perspective and in a subjective perspective. We have two views on it that it doesn't have itself. Frogs doesn't, might not see the world in forward and backward and up and down, but we infer that it do because that's the way we see it. So the frame of reference is an issue because we attribute, and I'll come into it a little bit more down here, 
But when we look at fMRIs, for example, we see the person behaving in one way, and we see the images of, of when they were doing that. But essentially, there's a frame of reference issue in that, because we have both perspectives. We can't draw any definite conclusions from it. Um, anthropomorphism and anthropocentrism are related to each other. Anthropomorphism is the misassignment or misattribution of human qualities to other things. Like with the frog example, we, uh, we might think that it sees the world as we do, and so we come to conclusions about what frogs do and don't, based on our qualities. Uh, anthropocentrism is, we see the human being as the pinnacle of evolution. We, we derive from, from religion that humans are, are um, made in, um, what's it called? Uh, made to reflect how God looked or, or, or was. Um, and it started with the whole human, the, whole, the body, so to speak, or, or everything. But eventually they said that, well, okay, maybe not the body, but mind is amazing and brilliant and awesome. And now we've sort of moved to, well, okay, brain is, is the most complex and amazing thing that's out there. And having that perspective on the brain, we're going to attribute it things that might not be there. We see complex behavior and we assume that the brain is complex because of that. But that's not necessarily true. Um, in the discussion later, I'll, I'll go through some examples of that. It's, there are some quite neat biological um, things in, in robotics as well. But it's outside of scope right now. So all of these, to me, perpetuate all these fallacies. We get stuck in a, in a perspective that, that convinces us that it is a certain way. And it is very believable if you look at the state of psychology, because this is what everything is based on. That guy doesn't want to let go of a ghost. I thought it was fitting. So, what should we do instead then? If, if representationalism is, is fundamentally wrong, and the brain doesn't do what they say it does, I propose that we, we take a change into something called embodied cognition. Um, it's not strictly, embodied cognition is, is an umbrella term for a lot, for a lot of different ways of, of, of viewing body, mind, and, and uh, environment. Um, I'm looking specifically at something called radical embodied cognitive science. It's called radical because usually it's criticized as if it is. It's not really. All it says is that we, we won't allow representations. Representations is not something that the human brain does. And that's why it gets critiqued as radical, when in fact I don't really think it is. But it's based on Gibson's ecological psychology. And again, you could compare this, this to Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, or Pratchett's The Discworld, because he's, he's not only created something new, he's, he's defined what it is everything is. And it's quite a big thing. He's done the grunt work, and so a lot of credit is due to him for this. But again, I'll focus on the radical and body cognitive science stuff. I'll try and go through it. There are quite a lot of definitions coming at you right now, but um, I'll try and be as clear as possible. So the environment is, is essential. The environment is defined as, as where we live, where we do things, where we are, what we perceive. And it's very specific in a sense because um, the atomic world that physicists deal with, that's not an environment because that's not where we live or organisms live. The astronomical world with planets and stuff, that's not either where we live. So that's not an environment either. The environment is where we are in our daily lives. Um, it relies on, on, on a concept called substances, and it's divided up into, into solids, liquids, and gaseous substances. Uh, solids aren't easily changed in shape. Liquids are formed by the solid container that they're in. So for example, a lake is formed by the rock bottom, or how that's, that's shaped. Uh, and the gaseous part of the world is, is not shaped at all. Um, because there are no sharp transitions in air, as we perceive it. Um, homogeneity in the gaseous spaces is important because it permits light waves <coughs> and it permits sound waves. 
Um, it allows chemicals to, to emanate and it affords respiration and movement for us. The gas is part of the environment that is, is our medium. It's where we live, it's where we can do things because of these things. Uh, a fish, a fish's medium is, is water. And it doesn't speak against the, the definition itself. We just have to be specific of what we're talking about and where it is doing something. Um, size is of obvious importance. We organisms are as small as a fraction to a millimeter up to a few meters. Um, and also in weight, we're quite limited. We don't exist on the extreme scales like the atomic or, or astronomical world. So another good concept here is, is persistence under change because the environment has a certain shape, a layout. And it's both permanent and changing. So when we speak of permanent, that's obviously a relative, in a relative sense. Um, and it depends on the time frame for persistence. So permanent objects only exist a certain amount of time, but some objects can obviously persist a very long time. Now, if we take an ice cube as an example, uh, if it melts, a physicist would argue that, well, we have con conservation of matter, so it doesn't really go out of existence. But that's not entirely true, because there is something that does go out of existence, and that's a light-reflecting surface. The ice cube isn't there to be perceived anymore. So we start talking about something called the ambient energy array. And what it is, if we take light as, as an example, or seeing as, as perceiving, uh, it relies on two things. One thing called ambient, ambient lights and one thing called structure. So if you imagine you're in a room that's wholly uh, fog-filled, um, but lighted with, with sunlight, for example, it has ambient light because you do, your receptors are um, activated. But it doesn't have any structure. We can't see anything. Uh, instead, structure comes about from light reverberating on items, objects, the environment, um, and then strikes our, uh, our receptors. So an ambient energy array has both, and it enables us to perceive things. Invariance is, is another important concept here. Um, a few examples of which is that gravity pulls down, not up. Uh, the medium lends itself to respiration and movement. Um, radiant light comes from above, from the sun. And so these affordances are invariant, and they've been constant throughout evolution. It's something that we've relied on for our survival. Um, when it comes to perception, then, um, we have an essential structure, which is what, <clears throat> at any point, there will be a structure. And a perspective structure is if you're there observing it. So, there is an invariant structure in the ambient light area. And by us being in a certain place observing it, we have a perspective structure. And the perspective structure changes because we move. We move our head, we move our eyes. But the essential structure doesn't. Another um, philosophical, um, of philosophical importance is direct perception. Um, and it, it basically means that um, we perceive what's, what's really out there. What's, what's, what, we, what we perceive is there. That's what the world is like. And specifically in, in radical embodied cognitive science, um, we find the meaning of things as well outside in the environment of objects, not inside our brain. And it comes about through the structure from perceiving structure. The structure immediately lends itself to meaning or its color, layout, shape, what have you. So, exteroception is, is similar to uh, what I was talking about with um, essential perspective. Exteroception is, is a, a visual field 
a possible visual field. It's, it's not where some observer, observer is, but it's a possible one. You can be there. And if you are there, you have something called proprioception and ego reception. Ego reception refers to that you always see yourself. Where, wherever you are observing something, you see yourself. You see the, inside, the outside of your nose, for example. You almost often see your hands and arms, sometimes your hair. You're always a part of what you see in the environment, and you can't distinguish between those two because you always see yourself that way. A good example of this is there, um, they, uh, Gibson himself um, did an experiment with, with a glass floor, where he, in one condition, put a paper just underneath the glass, and in another um, uh, a situation where he put it far beneath the glass. And what this, this does is that I mean, for grown-ups, you, you understand that you can stand on it, and it's, it's not an issue, because we have experience with it. But for animals and babies, if you put them on this glass, they can obviously see themselves, but they can't see themselves connect to any surface. Uh, so you have ego reception, and you have tactile. You can feel that you're on something, but you can't see. So there's, uh, there's a contrast there between the senses. And what happens is that Animals and babies become very distressed. They whimper and they show signs of distress. And some animals even adopt the posture they have when they're falling, when they're standing on the glass. So it's a very important thing that we do see ourselves all the time. And that is indistinguishable from whatever else we have in our visual field. So we're going to move on to uh, past, present, future. I'm just going to go through it briefly. There's a lot to be said about it. but. Uh, these are important concepts because memory and imagination obviously is used very much and it's a very common sensical type thing that you'd think is quite difficult to account for without representations. Um, but one issue, say, with representationalism, with memory and imagination is that it has a very hard time discriminating between those two. It, there are no really good definitions of them that separates them enough uh, if you think about a conscious experience of these two. Um, but one thing they have been trying to found, find out is, is where perception ends and memory begins. And they have a lot of terms for this. They have working memory and, and uh, long-term memory and uh, there are 20 plus other types of memories that you can have. Um, but one issue that they've come across that they have, have still have issues solving is that, well, when does memory begin? When is, when is there a clear-cut line? between memory and perception. And you'd like to think that it's, it's when, because uh, obviously if, if you don't get any more reception on your, um, if your receptors aren't firing anymore, there's, there's an obvious sense there, a cutoff, but that's still not something that they account for, that they say is to be the case. Because we still do perceive some parts of it even after we, uh, we don't have uh, excitation of our receptors. So, this presents itself as an issue for, for representationalism, for example. But what embodied cognition tries to get across is that the past-present dichotomy, for example, doesn't actually exist. Perception doesn't end. Perception is consistent. It, it continues. Um, so we don't really talk about past in the same sense that it's a linear, again, uh, line from back then to now. Uh, but it is still just perception. Um, in a similar manner to this, adopting the view of another person, um, it's not an advanced achievement of conceptual thought as it is in representationalism. Um, all it means is that I can perceive surfaces that are hidden at my point but unhidden at yours. Um, this only means that I can perceive a surface that's behind another, but we can perceive the same world, if this is the case. Being aware of the environment behind your head um, is to be aware of the persistence of the environment, the invariance of the environment. If you want. Affordances is, is a very um, central concept in, in, in body cognition as well. Um, it is what the environment um, 
affords to a specific organism, what an organism can do, essentially. Uh, there's a very famous quote of, of Gibson where he muddles what you thought you knew of affordances and then he sort of throws this at you and you don't really know what it is anymore. But the point he makes when he says that it's neither subjective nor objective or both is that you don't really need to separate, they're just two points of perspective. They're not something real in that sense. And in, in embodied cognition, uh, an affordance is something that points both ways, to yourself and to the environment. Um, kicking a ball relies on both your physical makeup and the environment there that would lend itself to that behavior. So an affordance always points to both the environment and yourself. So there is no real subjective or objective thing about it. thesis experiments. Um, one issue that I'm having with my experiments is that what they're, what they're saying is that depictions, pictures of an apple uh, is not the same as seeing an apple um, on the table. Uh, depictions doesn't afford us any things. We can look at them, but they don't, there's no behavior or movement or anything else tied to it. It's, it's something static. Um, and the issue, obviously, is then that, well, what if you want to do stuff on screens? Um, because that's essentially depictions, and you can't really do anything. And so, my proposition is that the only thing you really need to do is append the word virtual to it. Because I've been growing up with computers since, since I was uh, very, very little, and I still play to some extent. Less now with my thesis, but... Um, and I obviously get immersed into the environments. I, I try to figure out what behaviors I can, I can do, what's possible. You, you explore this environment in roughly the same way as you do in real life. Um, and so I believe it's very important to account for computer experimentation because it's a huge area and it's very, it, it lends itself as a tool very well to experimentation. So I want to instead just say, well, fine, it's not of affordances because I do agree with that to start. Um, but we can just call them virtual affordances instead. An example of this is, is, is a game called League of Legends. And just briefly, there you choose a character, and there's 110 characters <coughs> available for you to choose. You play five against five, so that's 10 characters in total. You have five specific abilities to each uh, character. Um, so already there, we have 50 virtual affordances, different ways of acting in this environment. And I haven't even talked about the specifics of the, uh, of the environment itself, where you can move, where you can't, how these characters differently interact with the environment, and all of the objects that are in the game, there's an economic system, and there's lots more. So even if you're not into computer gaming, this this there should be a realization that it's a complex environment and you try to navigate through it in roughly a similar way that you do in real life. Um, obviously there are specific uh, points and objectives and games, but uh, it's a very complex system. And it lends itself to quite extreme behavior. Uh, a good example of which is rage quitting, um, which essentially means that um, you're sufficiently angry, regardless of why, uh, that you physically like leave the game prematurely, and you usually swear a lot before you do that. Um, so, it has <laughs> obviously emotional and physical consequences for yourself as well, which is another reason to pursue this. So, what I specifically wanted to do was, um, I didn't only want to stick to, to a perspective and do my uh, experiment within that perspective. I want to find, try and find a way to be able to contrast um, computation, which is roughly uh, a part of representationalism, um, with more ecological strategies. Um, what I have in, what my, my manipulation is, is that I have an object flying on one side of the screen to the other, and you control another object, and you're gonna try and hit that moving object. And 
these two different strategies should reveal differences if you're actually using a computational strategy or you're using a more ecological one. Uh, if you're using a, a, a more so computationalist approach, the, the idea is that you're going to see roughly where this thing is going and you're going and sort of map out where they'll intersect and you point to your thingy there and it'll hit eventually. So you'll get straight lines essentially as a result. Whereas an ecological strategy would then say, well, we aren't computers, we don't think like that. Uh, what we do is we follow the environment, we look at the environment, and that's what we interact with. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll try and hit this thing, and we'll uh, change our direction more and more towards it. And what we'll get is more uh, arcs than, than straight lines. Um, my obvious issue with, with, with this experiment is that it's horribly... Uh, ecologically, it's not, it's not ecologically valid. It's a two-dimensional thing, it's a very simple uh, game. But my point isn't to actually contrast. My main point is to make is that we can experiment with screens even within, within this perspective, and it's an important thing to account for. What I would like to do is prove this point with something that actually will give me results. Uh, a a three-dimensional inter interceptor is the, I named, named my, my program that. Uh, and essentially what you would do is you'd have the first person's perspective of looking up towards the sky and you're going to hit some object that's moving up there. And I believe that if you have a three-dimensional perspective on this, you'll most definitely see arcs um, and in a much clearer way than my simple two-dimensional programs um, for future research, I guess, but I have to complete this one first. So. All right. Thank you for turning up and listening. Uh, thoughts, questions, criticism. But we'll have a short break, I think, first, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are.